All right. Hey, good morning, everyone, and good morning to everybody. Uh, yeah, it's great to see you, and it's great to uh, have all of you watching online, and um, we look forward to having our whole church back um, next Sunday. Well, hey, uh, last week, um, my daughter-in-law participated in our local uh, demonstration march, and we showed up. It, it, we all met at a park, and I saw a bunch of folks praying, and we participated in that. And I said, hey, this is, this is going to be pretty cool. There's a lot of believers here. And so we started the march, and we're out in the middle of a main street in town, and, we're, and my daughter and I, we were just right in the middle of it. And uh, not a lot of social distancing going on, but, uh, you know, we were out there supporting justice, and, and a lot of people uh, had their signs out, and some were yelling, and some were praising God, others were cussing, and, and, and then others were, uh, were uh, kind of uh, chanting, and some of the chants that were going on um, were, say his name, say his name, and others were um, uh, saying, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, Hey, I'm all for justice, and I support that. But I got to tell you, the phrase that came to my mind was this, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. You know, we've, uh, we've got a, a lot of things that we could be anxious about these days. I mean, it's crazy. It's one of the most craziest times uh, I can remember experiencing in my lifetime. I mean, we can be anxious and stressed about the COVID-19, the coronavirus. We're in our third month with this. Uh, people are wondering, man, am I going to be able to stay healthy? Um, when, is, when are they going to find a vaccine? Parents are, are kind of anxious, like, what, what does this mean for my kids? Uh, when can they go back to school? What's that going to look like? Others are turning on the TV every night, and we're seeing the unrest in our country. Uh, some folks have lost their jobs. Other people aren't sure they're going to have a job when this whole thing settles down. I mean, there's a lot in our society to be worried about, to be anxious about. And I want to say this this morning, anxiety is like a thief, and it can steal us of our joy and our peace. You know, Jesus was sharing with his 12 disciples that he was going to be taken and falsely accused and crucified. And they were stressed out about that. They were worried. They were anxious. And this is what Jesus said in John 16, 33. He said, now I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Now in the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, Jesus said. I have overcome the world. Again, what do we learn here? From the very words of our Savior, no Jesus, no peace. That's what he's saying. Now in our passage today, we've been working our way through the book of Philippians, and that was a, a, a real church in the city of Philippi, and they were anxious about a number of things as well, and so Paul took the time in his letter to address some of these concerns let me read to you what he said in Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 9. Paul said this, I entreat Eudia, and I entreat Syntyche, those are names of two women in the church, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone, for the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, Paul says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Finally, brothers and sisters, there were women in the church as well, whatever is true, 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul's words to an anxious church as he himself was in a very anxious situation in prison. Words that I think uh, that we could learn from, that we could be encouraged by. Let's spend some time and talk with God. Would you bow your heads, please? Father in heaven, Lord, it's a crazy world that we find ourselves in right now. Yet you are our peace. To know you is to truly know peace. You are the God of peace. Your son is the prince of peace. And yet, Lord, I know that there are many out here today that are not experiencing peace. There's stress, there's worry, there's anxiety, there's concern. Lord, we need to increase our peace. (laughs) I pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds this morning. Encourage us with your word. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. So in Paul's letter, I see three ways where you and I can increase our peace. And the first is this, we need to choose to live peaceably with others. We need to choose it. Key word, choose to live peaceably with others. Because when we're not at peace in our relationships and our families at work, and especially with the body of Christ, with our friends and family here in the church, man, that can cause a lot of anxiety and stress. Now, uh, I've grown up in the church. I've served in many churches in my lifetime. And I gotta tell you, I have seen um, a lot of church splits. I have seen a lot of uh, folks leave the church over all kinds of different uh, disagreements and preferences and things like that. Um, I've, seen, I've seen churches split over whether we sit in pews or chairs, whether the choir robes are red or blue, or whether we even have choir robes, right? How about music style? Do we worship with an organ and hymns, or do we have drums and electric guitars and sing praise songs? Um, I, I've seen all kinds of tension in the church over, over leadership. One group says, well, we like the pastor. I know this. <laughs> Others might say, we don't like the pastor. <laughs> I hope you like me. Um, We like the board, we support the board, we don't support the board, and on and on, and all these tensions can happen within the family of God. I've seen folks get upset over church finances and building programs. Well, I don't think the building should look like that, I think it should look like this, and if they don't change the design and it looks like that, then I'm going to pick up and leave. (laughs) Really? I mean, I've seen things like that. Sometimes people leave when a certain ministry program He's canceled because it's, it's lost its effectiveness and, and, uh, and misunderstandings happen and all these different things can lead to tension and stress and worry and anxiety. And you know what? These sort of things were happening in the church of Philippi. It doesn't get talked about a lot. Uh, when you're going through the book of Philippians, you know, it's all about joy, and that's what Paul's all about. And it's true, that is the theme of the letter. And yet, man, there are some problems going on in Philippi. There was some tension between two women, and it was serious enough that Paul felt he needed to address it, and he named names. you got to realize, when a letter would be written by the apostle sent to a church, they would read that letter publicly to everybody. How would you like your name to be read out if you were having a difficulty with somebody else in the church? Well, that's what's going on here. And so Paul says this in, in Philippians 4.2. He says, I entreat. Uh, Another word for that might be, I beg, I plead. 
dear sister Yudia, and I, I, and I entreat, I beg, I plead with Syntyche, agree in the Lord, sisters. Agree in the Lord. Now, we don't know what their disagreement was about, but it must have been serious. And Paul doesn't lay out five ways for you to agree in the Lord. I think what he's saying is, listen, because you both belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. Because you call Jesus your Savior, that should be enough. Settle your disagreement. Work it out. Agree in the Lord, Paul says. Maybe that's a <laughs> that's good wisdom for you and I. Man, when we've got tension with somebody in the church, a brother and sister in Christ, you know what? We're not always going to agree on things. There's a good chance we're going to have different preferences, different opinions. But you know what? For the sake of peace and the love of Christ, maybe we need to agree to disagree sometimes. Maybe we need to take the high road and be gracious with that person. Maybe we need to learn how to yield our own rights for the sake of love and peace. I know this is revolutionary stuff. <laughs> Maybe we need to, to remember what Paul said in chapter 2 where he said, don't just consider your own interests, but consider the interests of others as well. Hmm. Now, Paul's a realist. <laughs> he knows that this not, might, might not be an easy thing for the two women to work out, so he calls on others to help out. He says in verse 3, yes, and I ask you also, true companion, now, we don't know who that true companion is of Paul's, but it must have been a close friend, another leader in the church at Philippi. And he says, hey, listen, my true companion out there, help these women, okay? He's saying, help them. Paul recognizes they might not choose to live peaceably with one another. They might take, not take that high road. They might not choose to agree to disagree. They might not choose to, to yield their rights. They might not choose to look out for the other's interests as, as more important than themselves. And so, my true companion helped these women to agree in the Lord, who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And then he goes on and he says in verses four and five, so rejoice in the Lord always. Don't let something like this disagreement, this argument, don't let this fester into division and above all, don't let it steal your joy, church, and your peace. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says. And, and I'll say it again, like a broken record, he's been saying it through his whole letter, rejoice. He says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. What does that mean? He's saying, listen, within the church, and within the community, you should be known, Philippians. Hey, Calvary, you should be known for your reasonableness. That it's not a place of continual arguments and division and strife and anxiety. No, it's a place of love place of forgiveness, a place of truly considering the interests of others above your own. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone, for the Lord is at hand. <laughs> when we choose to live peaceably and reasonably with our brothers and sisters, especially in the house of God, I think we'll find that joy will replace the anxiety and the stress. <laughs> you know, there was a time in my life where um, I agreed to take a little church for one year as their interim pastor. And I gotta tell you, that was a hotbed, man. Those people, they, <laughs> that church had been around for 30 or 40 years, but they'd barely grown to over 150 people, and I could see why. Man, they were just ornery, you know? <laughs> they were a tough group of people. I mean, I went there and I was all happy. I was going try to try to grow them, their church for a year, and, and grow in the Lord, grow numerically, help give them some new ideas. I don't know what I was thinking. Listen, I remember uh, preaching my first sermon, and, uh, and a lady made an appointment to meet with me. And I thought, oh boy, what's this? 
So she came in and she said, you offended me on Sunday, pastor. And I said, what? What did I do? She said, you were preaching about me, weren't you? I know you were. Because what you were talking about, that, that was me, wasn't it? I said, I promise you, I was not thinking of you when I said that. Perhaps you're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And she looked, she said, now that's offensive. And she was just angry. And just about every Sunday, she would come up thinking that I was talking about her in our messages. Another guy loved to evaluate my Sunday morning dress. And at that particular church, uh, they made me wear a tie. And I remember after I would preach, this gentleman would come up to me, smile in the love of Jesus, and say, uh, nice, nice sermon, pastor, but I don't like your tie. It doesn't match your shirt. And I'm like, okay, what was in your Cheerios this morning? I mean, wow. Okay, and I just kind of smiled. And, and I kept getting these little attacks from this church. And it was starting to affect my joy. And I was starting to stress about it. I said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. Lord, I am just going to choose to live peaceably with these dear people. Try to be example. I'm just going to love them. I don't care, whatever they bring, I am just going to love them. And it changed. I was able to be joyful and have peace with everybody. I enjoyed being their pastor. That lady came up to me, same scowl on her face. Pastor, you were talking about me last Sunday, weren't you? I said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yes, yes I was. <laughs> and that guy would come up and say, you know what, I don't like your tie. And I'd go, that's okay, I don't like that you people make me wear a tie. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Right? And man, I was having a great time with them. The minute that I just decided, you know what, I'm going to choose to live peaceably with these folks. This is the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 16. It says, live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty. And then Paul goes on in Romans 12, chapter 18. It says, if possible, as far as it depends on you. Now notice that, if possible. It's not always possible, but as far as it depends on us, live peaceably with everyone. Man, you do that and you'll increase your peace. There's an old um, proverb that kind of says it this way. It says, you know what? If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. And, and if there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in our cities. Man, people have to choose to live peaceably with one another. It goes on, if there is to be peace in our cities, there must be peace in our neighborhoods. If there is to be peace in our neighborhoods, there must be peace in our families. Then it says, and there, if there is to be peace in our families, there must be peace in our hearts. And I would say, if there is to be peace in our hearts, there must be peace with God. To know Jesus is to know peace to choose to live peaceably with others. Second way to increase our peace is to replace worry with prayer. To replace worry with prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but the next two verses that Paul writes in this chapter in Philippians have been life verses for me. And as I bumped into people, it's been life verses for a lot of people. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, I need that verse. I have memorized that verse. Why? Because in my human nature, I can get stressed out. I can worry. I can become anxious. Can I have an amen from anybody in the room here today? I hear you people watching online. I know. I know. It happens. We try to live in the peace of God, but man, we can feel anxious about all kinds of stuff. Listen, I don't know about you, but man, I, I can stress out about things that are totally out of my control. And, and I can stress out about things that ultimately never happen. But I spent all this time, all this energy, all this effort worrying about him. Man. Now, now the Apostle Paul, he says in verse 6 to the Philippians, Now, do not be anxious about anything. That word anxious means um, kind of this, this out-of-control thought pattern. 
where, where we're focusing on the what ifs and the worst case scenarios. And yeah, the Philippians had some things to be anxious about. They were anxious about this division between the two women, Judea and, and Syntyche, and within their church. They were anxious about their beloved Apostle Paul, who founded their church, who, who led them to the Lord, who discipled them. He's in prison. He's facing an audience before Caesar. Uh, he, he might not, not make it out alive. They were anxious about that. They were anxious about false teachers that were coming in, and, and some, some Jews who had trusted Jesus as their Savior, and yet they were making all the Philippians, the Gentile Christians, take on Jewishness, like, like with the men. Hey, you gotta be circumcised. If I'm a Philippian guy, a new believer in Jesus, I'm not real excited about that. That might make me anxious, okay? That's what's going on. They had a lot of reason to be anxious. And Paul says, listen, don't be anxious about anything. Now, when I personalize that and I read it, I'm thinking, anything? Really? Anything? I mean, think about it. You might be talking to God, say, listen, Lord, I'm in my 30s, I'm in my 40s, and I'm still single. I've always had that desire to be married and to have a family, but it hasn't happened. And I've talked to a lot of people who are anxious about that. Or, or, or maybe your prayer is, you know what, I'm divorced, Lord, and, and I'm trying to raise my kids on my own, and, and finances are so tough, and I don't have any time to myself, and, and I'm anxious, and I'm worried over that. Or you might be a student saying, man, the pressure and the requirements of my reading and the papers that I have to write and the exams I have to take and the grades that I have to get, that's, it's too much, it stresses me out. Paul, you kidding me? Be anxious about <laughs> nothing? Really? Hey, we just got the doctor's diagnosis, and it's serious, and we're worried about it. We're stressed about it. We're anxious. We just got that pink slip, and we've lost our job. What are we going to do? We don't have any prospects on the horizon. Finances are tight, and we can go on and on and on. Listen, when Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. It doesn't mean that, that we don't do anything about it. It doesn't mean that we don't take our circumstance seriously. It doesn't mean that we don't go out and seek counsel and advice or resources. No, I think what he's saying here is don't try to handle it all just on your own power. Don't try to handle it by yourself. Instead, in everything, pray about it. Pray about it. I think Paul is saying this. If I can worry, I can pray. Let's say that together. One, two, three. If I can worry, I can pray. Think about that. Think of all the time, energy, and effort that you might spend worrying about something going on in your life. And what if you took all that energy, all that effort, and just turned it into prayer? See, when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. Let me say that again. When we work, when we worry, we work. When we pray, God works. I don't know about you, I'd rather have God working with the situations and tough circumstances that I'm concerned about in my life. We think of the Apostle Paul. I mean, remember when he founded this church, it wasn't an easy thing. People got angry at him for preaching Jesus and some of the results of people getting saved. And so they grabbed him and they falsely accused him. They threw him before the local government officials in Philippi. And without a, a fair trial, they stripped him naked. They took out rods. They beat the apostle Paul. I can imagine he was bruised all over his body, maybe some broken bones. And then they grabbed him and they threw him down in the inner, uh, the inner cell of the prison where it was dark and damp, and they put his feet in stocks. Now, if I'm the apostle Paul, I might be looking up to heaven and saying, what is going on, Lord? I'm trying to be faithful to you. I'm trying to, to fulfill the mission that you gave me to tell the, the Gentile world about salvation in Jesus. And I have been beaten 
and I've been humiliated, and, and I'm in prison. My feet are in stocks. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I can't do your mission while I'm in prison, or, or who knows what's going to happen. Maybe they'll kill me. Paul had every right to be worried and anxious about his situation, but look how he responded. Him and his partner Silas in Acts 16, 25. It says, about midnight, in that dark, damp, prison cell with their feet in stocks, beaten and bloodied. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And all the other prisoners in that jail were listening to them. See, Paul understood how to replace worry with prayer. And God worked through him. He says in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, this is a very important verse. This should be highlighted in your Bibles, circled, underlined, why? Because it's one of those few verses where it actually tells us what God's will is for us, right? We've always got that question, Lord, what's your will for my life? And there are some, some scriptures in the Bible that say it very plainly, and this is one of them. Well, I want you to have a joyful attitude. Rejoice always. I, I, I never want you to stop praying. Pray without ceasing. And I want you to give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for us. I gotta tell you, I don't always live up to that. I, I'm ashamed to say, you know, when, when this coronavirus hit, and, and after the first three weeks or so or month, and, and we got the financial statement, and it looked like our giving was um, 60% below normal. 60%. We were only taking in 40% what we normally did. And myself and the deacons, when we saw these figures, we just thought, wow, we're in trouble. What are we going to do? Well, pastor, you better write a letter to the church and tell them that, that this is important. And we know these are challenging times, but we need to respond in faithfulness to our giving. So I did. And that letter went out, and a lot of you received it. And I got to tell you, I, I was praying, but I was worried. I was anxious. You know what we found the very next day after we sent out that email? That there was a, comp a computer glitch in our financial records. It was nobody's fault. There was just a glitch. And in actuality, the giving of our people was completely faithful. We were right where we needed to be. And <laughs> we were just like, wow. You know, replace worry with prayer. God is there. He knows what's going on. Give thanks in all circumstances. This church is 60 years old. God has provided for this church all those years. And you know what? Even within the craziness of this pandemic, God is continuing to provide for his church here at Calvary. And I'm so grateful. Paul goes on in Philippians 4.7. He says this. Next, oh, in 4.6. So he tells us, remember, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Let your request be, be made known to God. So Paul is saying, look, when you pray, you need to pray with that attitude of thanksgiving. In other words, I interpret it this way. When I am dealing with something that I'm worried about or anxious about, I will stop and remember the times where I went through other situations and God was right there with me and God provided and I thank him for that. And then I trust him for what I'm going through in the present. Does that make sense? That's praying with an attitude of thanksgiving. He goes on in verse seven. If you do all that, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That peace of God that we receive, I believe it's two things. One is the confidence of our salvation. 
And second is the confidence that God is in control of our situation. Confidence in our salvation, confidence that he's in control, that gives me peace. And Paul was trying to communicate that peace to the Philippians. And he says, and that peace of God is going to guard your hearts and minds. like a, it, It's a military term. It's like a sentry, standing guard, so that we'll be protected from destructive thoughts that might come in to our heads, that God will be there with us. So listen, you want to increase your peace? It's not found in trying to eliminate everything in life that might be uncomfortable or that might challenge us. It's found in giving it to God through prayer. Replacing worry with prayer and trusting that he's with us through it all. There was a king who asked his subjects, I want someone to paint me a perfect picture of peace. And so all the artists got to work, and many, many paintings were submitted. And the king came down to two paintings that he liked. One was a painting of a, of a beautiful lake surrounded by snow-capped mountains with fluffy clouds in the sky. And when people looked at that painting, they thought, this is a perfect picture of peace. But there was another painting that the king also liked, and this was very different this painting had mountains too, but they were rugged and jagged. And the sky was dark. And there were thunders and lightning clouds. And, uh, and there was a waterfall. And it was powerful and strong. And the water was coming off a cliff face. And, and, the, and the waters were crashing upon the rocks below. It looked very different than the other painting didn't look peaceful at all. And yet the king noticed that behind the waterfall on the cliff, a little bush had grown in a crack in the rock. And in that bush, a mother bird had built a nest and was sitting on her eggs in perfect peace. That's the painting that the king chose. And when he was asked why, he said, because peace doesn't mean that there's no noise and no confusion. Peace is being able to be still within our own hearts while all of that craziness is going on around us. And I would say for the follower of Jesus that true peace is found not in the absence of trouble or viruses or injustice and demonstrations in our own country. True peace is found in the confidence that God is right in the middle of it with us. That's true peace. Third way that we can increase our peace from Paul's letter is this. We need to feed our minds with better things. Feed our minds with higher things. Feed our minds with good and righteous and godly things. You know, I've talked to a lot of people, and they wonder, you know, man, why, why don't I have peace? Why can't, I, why can't I experience God's peace? And my question is, what are you feeding your mind with? What are you feeding your mind with? What are you watching on TV? What are you reading? What kind of conversations are you having with other people? What are you feeding your mind with? Realize, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, you have God himself and the person of the Holy Spirit living within us, right? And when we fill our minds with some of the trash and garbage in the world, that's contrary to the will and the word of God, and we won't have peace. And Paul wants the Philippians to have peace. And so he says this in verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. 
You know, these are very opposite things of things like, you know, our, our minds can just be filled with lies and negativity and criticism and divisiveness and bitterness and, and violence and immorality and vengeance and hatred. And Paul flips it upside down and he says, no. He says, you want to you wanna experience peace? Feed your mind with better things, things that are true. Things that are honorable. Whatever is just, whatever is pure and lovely, commendable. Those things that are excellent, those things worthy of praise. Paul says, think on these things. I think a couple of things happen. I don't know about you, but you know, <laughs> just living in our society and culture, a lot of garbage comes in, right? I kind of see this, this pattern as a formula to dilute it. <laughs> the more that I can think about things that are true and just and pure, it dilutes some of the dirt and the poison that comes in. Secondly, all these things are a source of peace. If we focus on them, if we dwell on them. And finally, they also give us a guide for behavior. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where it starts. That word transformed is the Greek word metamorphosis. Picture the caterpillar going through metamorphosis, <clears throat> transforming into the butterfly. We are to live lives that are transformed into the image of Christ. That transformation starts in our minds. You want to have peace? What are you feeding your mind? Paul gives a pretty good list to focus on. And then he says, in Philippians 4, 9, as we close out this section of his letter, he says, all right, so let me wrap it all up. Here's what I want you to do, Philippians. Here's what I want you to do, church. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul being the real thing, a true follower of Jesus, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Good words. It's a crazy time. We all want to increase our peace. <laughs> really helpful things to think about. Choose to live peaceably with others. Remember that word choose, as far as it depends on us. Learn to replace worry with peace and remember to feed our minds with better things, higher things, good things. Godly things, righteous things. And the God of peace will help us experience his peace.